if my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, I hold on to what is true, though I cannot see. If the storms of life they come and the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands in faith. I will believe. I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours Mountain high or valley low I sing out, remind my soul that I am yours I am forever yours When my heart is filled with hope And every promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me Staying desperate for you, God <laughs> Staying humbled at your feet I, 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 I will move these it. hands and I'll pray I will believe Good morning! Welcome all of you here as we join together for worship. Just a couple of quick things as we get going. We're starting a new series today called Complete Joy. It is based on the first letter of John, and you're going to find that word in the text as we go along. We're going to unpack that. We're going to talk about it over the next five weeks, and we look forward to it. So get your heads around that and read on if you'd like on your own, and we'll continue uh, to talk about it each week. Also want just kind of a save the date for you. The 21st of this month at 2 o'clock is Pastor Tyler Cronkite's installation uh, as our new pastor here. So we look forward to that celebration. If you're able to make it then, just come and join us. Yeah. Awesome. The Lord has blessed us in immense ways, and we look forward to Tyler being on staff with us and sharing the load. So all good things. That's it. I'm going to invite you to stand, and I'll give it over to these guys. And lady. <laughs> well, we gather in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and as we do that, let's enter into this time in a moment of prayer. Gracious Father, you are so good to us beyond what we can really put to words. Lord, your mystery of grace is beyond our understanding, although we do try. Lord, as we come into this time, may we just rejoice in the fact that we are forgiven. May we rejoice and celebrate that your mercy is new every day, that there's no sin that can separate us from the love of God that we find through Jesus Christ. Lord, may we just be in a place, no matter the burdens that we carry, no matter the maybe the guilt or the conviction that we have, but that we can stand fully present before you this morning glorifying your kingdom, glorifying your name. And we give you thanks and praise. And may we give you the honor and you alone this morning.
I believe in the love he lived. us withstand all the storms that this world has to throw at us. So Lord, we give you praise that we can come to your word and that we can put our foundation and our trust in that. Lord, have your way this morning. Stir in our hearts and may we be reminded of the joy that we have in your son Jesus. We give you praise and thanks and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So as I announced, we're going to begin this series, Complete Joy, uh, that's going to be based in the first letter of John to the churches. And we're going to take a big bite today of that, so there's a little bit to, to go through, and we're going to unpack some of the verses, not all of it. But this is what John writes in this first section. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. And that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and that we proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, 
but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Like I said, kind of a big chunk to look at, um, but we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll try to make it clear. Um, if I use the term this morning to you, uh, a green screen, I would think the majority of you would know what I'm talking about in terms of a green screen. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a cinematic technique. It allows you to replace the background of whatever is in the foreground with another. I'm going to show you a concrete example, two slides. First of all, obviously you know why it's called a green screen. This is a person standing in front of the green screen. We use that kind of thing here. Uh, that color, the computer can latch onto and remove it from that picture. Now, this is what it looks like when you put a different background on it. And I, I say that because, you know, often when Sarah and I are watching a movie or a TV show, we kind of laugh at a scene like this, and we say, green screen, because you could tell right now, you could tell. I'm sure the technology will get advanced to the point you can't. But what we're saying to each other is that's not real. They're not standing in front of that scene that they're standing in. And I make that point to say that is so a part of our world right now. AI technology, artificial intelligence technology, can pretty much create anything you would ever need. I've seen it create people. They're still a little sketchy looking, but they're people. Um, research papers, cartoon images, music, sorry Trevor, voices, instruments. None of it is real, though. Uh, and I throw this out. Because the gap that exists in our world today, especially with our young people, on what is real now, that's the terminology, versus what is made up, is huge. And we really need to understand this because the, the norms of thought process that we're used to, you know, logic, receiving information, how we process stuff, is kind of all out of the window because the issue is no longer in our day and age, as Pontius Pilate said, what is truth. The issue in our day and age is what is real. And this is the challenge to us as believers right now in our world. But it's exactly what we're going to find uh, as we begin to look at this letter from John. What John's trying to get across to us as the church. And what he's trying to tell us is that all this, all this about Jesus is real. And so we're going to look at that. Now I just want to uh, set the stage kind of on the background of John's letters. It's been 60 years since the resurrection of Jesus and the church has grown and the church has been established, you know, as a worshiping community. It has faced and is still facing and will face persecution. It has been riddled already with false teachers and teachings that the apostles have leaned into to combat. All of the apostles, the 12 of Jesus except John, uh, have either been martyred or have died. So John is the only one that is left. And the time frame that John is writing in is from like 90 to 100 AD at the end of the first century. And in this time frame, John will write three things. He will write his gospel, the gospel of John. He will write these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he will write the revelation of Jesus Christ. i pause there. I want to talk about something else. Communication is a very interesting thing, and I say that. I love my children 
dearly, but man, they communicate very differently from each other. A couple of years ago, when the hurricanes uh, were hitting North Carolina, they both, both our girls live in North Carolina with their families, we wanted to find out how they were doing, so we called to ask if they were okay. This is how one of our girls responded. Lots of rain. It really kept coming down so much so fast. The streams were rising quickly. It started to overflow their banks. It was spilling onto the roads. Cars were getting stuck. People were stranded. We were out of power, wondering what's next, so we're coming to stay with you. <laughs> the other one, when I asked, said this. It's a lot of water, but we're okay. I'm sure you understand that. I'm sure you know people that communicate differently. And I say that because guess what? John is the first one. That's how John communicates. I would say the Gospel of Mark is the second one. He's very short and to the point. But John has really good reason to communicate that we. Because last week we celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. And that so profoundly changed and shaped the lives of Jesus' disciples that they would never be the same again. As Pastor Mark likes to say, this changes everything. And it did. They went from timid, locked up for fear of the authorities, deserting disciples, to bold proclamation in the face of opposition, immovable rocks of faith, testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. And even in the face of torture and death and imprisonment, nothing would stop them from speaking of what they knew, what they had seen, what they had experienced, their reality. For John, the truth and the reality of the resurrection gripped him for the rest of his life so powerfully that we really see it in this letter in the opening verses. And I say that because the first four verses of this letter of 1 John in the original language, in Greek, are what we would call a run-on sentence with no punctuation of any kind of any sort. And much kind of like if you and I were trying to relate a story that grips us with so much excitement, we just can't stop talking about it. And so I want to do that for you. I want to try to capture that excitement for you in just this moment. I want to try to read it the way that John wrote it for us to hear. So hear this again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and we have heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete complete. That's the excitement that John is trying to tell us. He has been gripped with ecstasy and incitement. This is like, man, I have got to tell you this moment. We heard it. We saw it. We touched it. And I'm telling you so that you too can catch the wave so that you too may have complete joy. That's how exciting this letter of John is to us. But I want to ask this question then. If that's our title, Complete Joy, what is complete joy? Well, first I want to say what it's not. Complete joy is not merely a fleeting emotion. And it is not something that is dependent upon favorable circumstances in our lives. One of the things that it is, is a deep and abiding sense of contentment and satisfaction that transcends eternal, situa external situations. It's a joy that is anchored in the eternal truth of God's word, anchored in God's love and grace through a relationship that has been created for us by the risen, living Jesus. That's part of what complete joy is that John's trying to get across to us. Second thing I forgot to mention about John's letter is often in his letters, he is referencing back to things that Jesus has said that are written in his gospel. And so I want to give you an example of that so you understand what I'm saying. So John writes here in his letter, 1 John, these words. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Now, thinking on that, I want to read you a couple verses from John's gospel so you get where he's pulling all this together from. The beginning of John's gospel. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then a little later on in that, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And then in John 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So you get that, that John is pulling stuff in that exists already in his gospel. But let's get back to complete joy and talk about what else is it? What else is it the result of? And I would say it is also the result of everything that Jesus died to gain for us. And one of those is fellowship and communion with God our Father. This fellowship that we have because of Jesus is in no way like our earthly fellowship with one another because it is a transcendent fellowship, a profound fellowship with the eternal. It's not just temporary, it's eternal. And it grows ever deeper, as John says, by walking in the light, and the light is Jesus, by deepening in that relationship with Jesus so that this complete joy that comes from knowing Jesus permeates our lives in so many different ways. Now, John goes on then to talk about our lives as believers and some of the pitfalls that happen to us, the failures, the things that happen. But he wants us to still know in the midst of all that in our lives, because of Jesus, there is still complete joy. And he says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John uses a term there, an advocate for us. It's a legal term, like in a courtroom, like one who is speaking for us on behalf of us to the judge in a courtroom. And that's Jesus. He said, Jesus, the righteous one. Jesus stands in front of the eternal judge of all creation. And what he's saying to that judge is this. I know Steve is guilty, but I've paid the price for him. I took his sin on me. But we also need to understand this, that the judge does not stand in opposition to the advocate. It's not an adversarial relationship where the judge wants to argue with the advocate for us because remember, the judge is the one who loves the whole world so much that he sent his one and only son. He wants the guilty to be forgiven. But the price for sin had to be paid. And Jesus was the one who paid it, our advocate for us. And so that's the picture John wants us to see, to see, that when we do sin, when there are these pitfalls, when things happen in our lives, Jesus stands in the gap for us still to plead for us. That's why we can have complete joy. And then finally, complete joy has this eternal perspective beyond us so much. Not, like I said, not dependent on current circumstance, but rooted rooted in the Word of God, rooted in the eternal promises that we have, and rooted in the love of Jesus that has been shown to us. And so John wants us to see that in these next couple of verses when he says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected, and by this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, he talks about commandment. Remember, and he's drawing back to his gospel. Remember what Jesus says to his disciples. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. 
By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is so important for John to get across to us, that what Jesus said, this love, needs to be something evident in our lives. And he uses the word perfected, which in the original language in the Greek is the word teleos. And teleos means to be fully mature, but it is also a word that isn't just a moment in time. It means both an arrival to maturity, but also a journey in maturity. And I just think about it this way. Very soon in Michigan, we will be able to go outside and see beautiful, fully grown trees with their foliage on. But we also know that that tree is still living and still growing, even though it is what we would call a mature tree. And what John is saying, it means that whatever comes our way, the circumstances of life that happen to us, we handle those with maturity through the love of Jesus, our Savior, that he has poured into us. And that we are never on this side of eternity finished in that place of learning maturity. Loving as Jesus loves, John is saying, shows we have maturity in the word and in Jesus. Now, I want to throw two words out, one of which I'm sure you're familiar with. The other one might be a little new to you, and those two words are this, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is the one I think you probably have heard before. Ortho means right. Doxy has to do with teaching and thinking, and praxy has to do with action. So what this is is saying and doing. And what John is saying in those verses is you cannot have one without the other because together what we say we know and what we do, those things together are maturity in Jesus Christ. And I say that because I think often in our day, you often hear in the church a cry for orthodoxy, that it always has to be right teaching and doctrine. But I don't know that we hear very much anybody making the cry for orthopraxy, for doing the things that are right. And that's what John's getting at when he says, to only say, I know him, but not acting in love as he did for us, that's not maturity. Maturity in Christ is both things together. It takes both to make love complete. You know, it's important that we guard doctrine, but we also at the same time need to talk about guarding love, love for one another, love for others around us. We have to do both in our realm as believers, which takes me back to the beginning where we started. Because one other thing that makes our joy complete is what we know is real. And what John is saying to us, these things I'm writing to you so that you may know these are real, the resurrection of Jesus, his forgiveness on the cross, his truth spoken to us in his word, his advocacy for us when we do sin. And if you and I are going to bridge this strange gap in our world, we not only have to say, I know him and know these truths, but our love has to be real at orthopraxy. It has to be the same love that Jesus has poured into us, that unconditional love that we have received. Our love and knowledge have to share equal footing. And when they don't, John says, because we know that in our lives, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we know that's a deceit to say we haven't failed. But John's saying when we fail, we don't run and hide it. We expose our failures in the light in Jesus, and we confess it so that the light of Jesus can change us, profoundly change us, as it did John. Because John's saying, because knowing and loving like Jesus, that yields for us complete joy. So this is what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, and we're going to continue to go on and look at 1 John and pull these things out that our joy may be complete, not only knowing, but also acting and showing as that love of Jesus has been poured into us also. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the cross. 
Thank you for your boundless love that surrounds us no matter what. Thank you that we can run into your light, the light of your truth that we find in your word. Expose our deeds and our sins and know that your light will heal us, that you are faithful to be our advocate, that you plead for us, and that our sins are forgiven because you are the righteous one who gave your life. Lord, may we show that kind of profound love to the world around us, real love, so that they may be impacted by that reality that comes from you. And they may hear and they may know that you are the one who died for them and rose again. In your name, amen. So I know Pastor Steve just went through a whole lot of scripture, but we're about to teach you guys a new song. <clears throat> and I think it's important for this piece particular to give a little context. Some of you may be aware, is it, aware of it as we sing it and teach it to you. But uh, in John 6, it says this, starting at uh, verse 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, seeing this miracle that Jesus provided all this bread and fish for people. It says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of God, the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Later on it goes to say this in Verse 35, starting in 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to, comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Later on it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of my Father, that anyone and everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him. He says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So as we sing this song, this is, this is what this, is, this song is referencing. Our sustenance, the thing that truly carries us, fulfills us, satisfies us, is nothing in this world. And I am stupid to, enough to think that it does constantly. So um, this is a song declaring that. We sometimes need to preach to ourselves, amen, to remind ourselves of who we are in Jesus Christ. So um, we are going to be singing this song here, whether you like it or not. So <laughs> I, encourage, <laughs> I, I encourage you guys, if, if you feel so led to join with us, um, to do that. And um, just uh, this is joy for us, truly. There's nothing we can do that nothing we have to do. We just receive this. So I pray that um, we are all blessed by the truth of God's word.
I've had my fill. This world can't sustain me. And it never will. Only you can. song don't worry be happy this one's about joy can you tell the difference seriously you know Jesus told the parable about uh, seed being scattered upon the different grounds and some took root and some did not and the one that landed on the hard ground it was there for a little while and was gone and choked out that's kind of like what happy is it's there, it's on extenuating circumstances, and it can change from one minute to another. Joy is actually the seed that fell on the good ground and grew root, and that strength, and all that happens only through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the joy that sometimes it is so hard for us to see in a world that we live in. We chase after happy. We chase after other things to make us feel good that are just temporal. In seeking happiness, we do in vain. But it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can take situations, those trials that just seem like we want to just make them a separate part of our life. We can just walk away from them. But help us understand just what you're doing in those moments with joy. Joy is growing roots in us to strengthen our faith so that when we go into the next trial, we've seen your glory. We know what you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, all around us. So those dark times, we can still have that joy. We're not depending on happy. And that all comes from knowing you, knowing your word. Father, also at this time, we want to lift up people that are seeking peace and healing. There are some I have on a list here, but there's others that aren't on a list, but are in our hearts. So as we go through these folks here, please lift them up as well. Because Jesus said, by my stripes, or he was said, by his stripes, we are healed. Now, healing takes all different meanings. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes we don't see it, but it is there. And there is a peace that goes beyond anything. And peace is also fruit of the Spirit. That is with its roots. So we lift up Ryder Finkel, Dave Peck, Mary McCollman, Laura Tom, Rick Webster, the son-in-law of Dale and Susan McGorman, Linda Huber, and one and a half month old Rosie. And there's others too, Father, that are just aching and looking to you and asking why. And sometimes we don't hear anything. But that's when we need to lean back, trust, and just know you are there. And so we, we seek for your peace, for your strength, for the family of Matt, who is a recent West Michigan Christian High School student who just graduated last year that passed away on Easter weekend of all weekends with a cardiac arrest. Those things, those things are hard to understand and we don't know why. 
Your plan is beyond anything we can fathom. So when those things come up, they rob us of happiness. But we need to dig deep. Dig deep so that through those trials, there's a joy knowing that they're all in your hands. We also lift our prayers of thanksgiving for the first communion class completing this weekend. That all those in that, Father, grow strong in their faith for you. That nothing can shake them. That they become warriors for you. Rooted and grounded, filled with a with all the good gifts of the Holy Spirit. And a gift that you've given us is, as a community of believers. Sometimes we don't know how to pray, but Jesus pulled us away when we're lost for words. As he told his disciples, we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen we also have the ability to profess our faith so i invite you all to stand as we recite the words of the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
we have a God that is chasing after us, just like in the prodigal son. Knowing that, don't keep running away from him. Stop, turn around. He will meet you where you are. And for that, we are grateful. Before the blessing, please know this, that we do have people that are gifted in prayer. If there's anything on your heart, whether it's a celebration of joy, or it's a valley you're going through, we are here to take that burden, share it with the Lord, and watch what he does. Now receive this blessing before you go. May the God, our God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you will abound with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Have a blessed day. Everything we want, you're everything.